Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, <laughs> depending on where you are tuning in from within the world. Um, up to those that tuned in an hour ago, my apologies and thank you so much for sticking with us and waiting for the start of this talk, which I'm sure is going to be a very good one. Angela, Vicky, thank you for coming in. Apologies for the confusion. Um, I'd just like to put it out there that I clearly need help with um, world time calculators. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to put that behind us and we're going to go ahead and enjoy the chat. Um, my name is Janet, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm delighted to be hosting today's talk with two highly respected wildlife photographers. Before we get started, though, I just want to mention that I'm completely amazed every time we have a webinar, but for this one in particular, as to how far and wide our audiences come from. For this webinar, we've got people that registered from Bermuda, Sri Lanka, Malta, right across Europe, the USA, Australasia, and of course, many from our home, home continent, Africa. Earlier in this year, I hosted a webinar celebrating women in wildlife photography, in which I chatted to two renowned female photographers, Piper McKay and Shannon Wild, about the challenges they overcame to forge successful careers as wildlife photographers and making their home in Africa. This was one of our most popular webinars, and we had such fantastic feedback. And on the back of that, I was inspired for the topic of our discussion today. In that talk, we spoke about making a career as a wildlife photographer in Africa. But of course, there are many of you out there that may not necessarily want to give up their lives, pack up their bags and move to Africa. Many of you would be interested in traveling here to photograph our nature and our natural world. There are, however, misconceptions and perhaps a fear of the unknown, particularly for women tra travelers. So to address that today, we look to we look at travel to Africa from a woman's perspective. Our panelists have both traveled Africa extensively. One has been working and traveling in Africa her entire life. Angela Scott, previous winner of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition, publisher of numerous wildlife books and television series. Angela was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and from the age of four lived in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania where she spent family holidays in the Serengeti National Park, which instilled her lifelong passion for conservation and photography. Joining Angela, we've got a multiple award-winning photographer, Vicky Santello, a member of North American Nature Photographers and Professional Woman Photographers. Vicky bases herself in Florida, USA. Vicky travels the world in search of wildlife destinations and has traveled countless times to Africa, mostly as a single traveler, and she has a wealth of information to share with us today. Welcome, Angela. Welcome, Vicky. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jenna. Right, I'm going to just kickstart this and go straight into it. Angela, I'm going to start with you. You were born and raised in Africa. It's always been a part of your DNA. You've been traveling through Af throughout Africa since the early days when it was considered the domain of adventure-seeking men only. Where did your inspiration come from? And tell us a little about your journey from a young girl playing on the plains of the Serengeti to the well-known photographer and passionate conservationist that you are today. Well, I, I feel that really it was a very different era that I was brought up in. And I consider myself incredibly fortunate because yes, I was born in Africa, but I was born from parents and a family. My grandparents also were in Africa, so on both sides. And I think, you know, I had most of my family were people who explored the world. They didn't stay still. And I have such wonderful memories of um, such interesting people within my family. And so, yes, it was, and it's, I think it still is, a very male-dominated world. But I never felt constrained by that. I never was pushed down. All my family, you know, I had terribly strong, wonderful women. My grandmother, you know, she, she went by muleback up into the uh, hills of Cordoba in Argentina. And and my grandmother on the other side was in Botswana and South Africa. So 
they all were very um, inspirational women, strong women. And I think as well, everybody was very artistic, rather eclectic, very, um, their friends were always very interesting. And as a child, we were very free. My brother was my best friend and, and he, you know, dragged me everywhere with him. So I was very much a tomboy. I wasn't considered a little girl in a pretty dress and kept down. I was allowed to do anything and everything I wanted to do. So um, my inspiration, I would say, because in those days, I mean, we had no radio, we had no television, we had no social media. We just had, you know, the freedom of the bush and nature to go and explore in. And my parents were wonderful in the sense they took us out to, you know, safaris the whole time. We'd gone long, long journeys, camping out, sleeping under the stars. Um, books were a very important thing. We would all read together wonderful stories. My, one of my grandfathers was an, uh, an author and an artist. So um, nothing seemed impossible. And it's a strange thing, you know, you want to be inspirational for youngsters coming into this profession. I don't feel that I'm very inspirational because I was so lucky in my upbringing and how I came into photography. My father gave me a, a small box brownie when I was very, very young. And I think because things were expensive and I had to save up my pocket money for every film, I learned, if you like, to see, I would have to look very carefully and think very, very carefully before I would press the shutter because there were only 12, um, 12 trannies in there and each one was really important because then I'd have to find more pocket money to get another one yeah. so I would spend hours in rock pools you know we lived on a beach with wonderful rock pools and I would sit for hours just looking waiting for whatever fish it was that I was looking at and and it, I think that that created an understanding of that patience, that watching, that waiting, um, and observing to to take pictures. And I and I then went on to bigger and better cameras and saving up for my own dark room. And it was always a passion. It was always a hobby. But there was no one there to say, "Well, why don't you do it as a job?" I just love taking photographs. So it was what I did. It was what, and it's always been the same. It was never because I wanted to be famous <laughs> or, you know, it was just something. I just love the art of photography. So I don't know if that answers your question, <laughs> but I feel very blessed and very fortunate of, of how my progression um, went through life and of course then you know meeting Jonathan um, it, everything fell into place and I had the fortune of having him there yes as a already very established wildlife photographer and I just slipped under the radar <laughs> and can still which I love to be that invisible person just being doing the supportive role but doing what I really love Thank you. Um, I think you sell yourself short. You you are an inspiration to many a generation, and it's maybe not because of your actions or what you do. And I know you like to stay from our chats that we've had in the background, but it's your work that's inspiring. And I think that's a great legacy <laughs> to leave behind. Now, Vicky, Vicky and I actually met three years ago on safari at Mashati Game Reserve in Botswana, where I work. Um, and we became instant friends. I had met a kindred spirit who shared a love of photography, travel, and nature. Vicky, your road to photography started later in life after a successful career in the finance industry. This is very different to what you used to do. Um, share a bit about the story. What inspired the change and what is the impact that it's had on your life? Well, thank you, Janet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my... Uh... My wake up moment, my aha moment was actually 
um, a very difficult one, a very painful one. In 2006, I um, was in a very serious car accident. I was actually a cyclist at the time and a, uh, an SUV basically plowed into my bike um, going at 55 miles an hour. So I was immediately a multi-trauma victim and every, everything that I knew changed within instance. I was confined to a wheelchair in a body cast. Um, it, was a, it was a long process. And during that period, one of the bright spots of my day was to see these photos run across my computer screen uh, as a screensaver. These were just snapshots uh, that were uh, taken of friends or of me or of famous cyclists. You know, it was the Lance Armstrong days. And it just, it, it validated who I had been and it sort of grounded me during this very traumatic period. So as I got stronger um, and I started to get outside with a walker and nursing aids, um, what struck me was you know, everything, the colors just popped because I had been inside for so long and Florida can be so lush and uh, colorful. So I had a little point and shoot and I was, I had my point and shoot in my basket and I would stop and take pictures and they were terrible. I mean, they never looked as good as what I saw on social media or what I had seen with my eye. And as one of my very dear friends says, I never do anything by halves. And she is, is English. And so she has that <laughs> wonderful accent and I don't. And so I challenged myself to learn how to shoot, to really learn how to be serious. I've always loved art, I've always loved nature. And so here in the, you know, in the shambles of what had been in a very exciting athletic, amateur athletic career, um, I could kind of reconstruct my life and reconstruct my identity, um, combining several things that I loved. You know, number one, nature, uh, number two, art, and number three, to be, you know, proactive and be creative. And since since that time, I've been traveling essentially exclusively for photography. I've met wonderful people like yourself, like Angela. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome. And, um, and that's launched me. I've been to places now that I never would have gone to otherwise. For example, the South Georgia Islands, which are extremely rugged and 50 foot seas to get there. And had I known what I was getting into when I signed up, I might not have gone. But now I travel specifically for photography purposes. And that's, that's very wonderful for me as well. It gives a purpose to my life. Oh, such an inspiring story there. And yes, I love that you mentioned the difficult places you've traveled to, but you've also done a lot of travel to Africa. And Africa is not as difficult, I think, to travel to as many people, the, the perception is especially these days, it's become easier. It's no longer, in the early days, it was only accessible to the intrepid travelers. It means now that we have a lot more people traveling to Africa than we ever have had in the past. Angela, you've been exposed to the safari industry and travelers for many years now. Um, have you actually, have you noticed a change in the way people approach travel to Africa? Oh, hugely, hugely, Jared. I think, um... I think, yes, with social media, with the internet, with the change of all information, you, you can pick up any, any information you want. And so there is a lot more people traveling to Africa, which is, you know, it's wonderful for Africa, for, for people to understand the beauty of these places. And in that, hopefully to preserve them for a little bit longer. But it um, obviously from the time that I was a child here, you know, we would go to Serengeti, Ngorongoro, places like that and never see anyone, you know, and it was a wonderful thing and people would be much perhaps slower and um, more respectful of nature. I find a lot of travelers now, um, perhaps they miss a little bit of what they're seeing because they come in so quickly and so passionately and want to take as many thousands of shots as they possibly can to go back with. 
Um, and I think maybe they miss the essence of what actually, you know, the wonder and the the magnificent of what, what they're actually seeing. Um, so that saddens me a little bit when I'm out in the field and I see, you know, I can be quietly with the lion pied and happy to sit there all day and then minibuses come charging past and people will come in and they will literally, you know, um, just jump out of the jump out of the roof hatch they'll take a thousand pictures and then they'll run away again and I'll think oh but you just miss something you miss, you miss the the beauty of what you're seeing just for the shot so that saddens me a little bit I think photography has changed so much from the time that we were um, perhaps looking at photography a little bit more as an art as opposed to um, a social media um, bonanza but um, there's good and bad in everything there's a positive there and there's there's a negative as well yeah I guess what it is doing it's giving Africa a lot of exposure and conservation a lot of exposure but yes if it can become a case of people rushing around just to get the shot and being disconnected from the environment which is really sad very so. Vicky, you have done, if I'm correct, your last count was 17 safaris to Southern Africa. <laughs> um, I have spent time with you on one of those. So I do know that you love the full experience as much as getting the photograph. Um, we'll talk about that a little later when we start to show some of your photographs. What have your experiences been? And have you got any advice to people planning a trip to Africa, particularly those that have not yet been planning their first trip? Yeah, sure. I would say it's really key to do your research uh, wherever you travel, whether it's Africa or any other destination. Um, the more research you do prior to departure, uh, the more likely you are to have a productive trip, especially from a photography point of view. So um, it's important to know which species you're trying to see uh, and what behavior you'd like to see, because you can take one animal and, and, and be there many times uh, during the year and see different behaviors. So, you know, if, for example, you want to see a wildebeest crossing, the migration, which Kenya is so famous for, and you show up in February, you're going to be sorely disappointed because that's not when it happens. Or even if you show up in August, if the rains don't happen um, the way they have historically, uh, you may also be disappointed. So I think it's very, very important to do your research. Uh, that goes for whatever gender you are. Um, and I think, I think though, it's, it's also important to realize that um, travel has, as Angela just finished saying, you know, the world has changed. And when I started traveling, my first trip to Africa was 1981. Um, you know, there was no security check-in. There was no, um, uh, you know, uh, TSA or all of these um, nece necessary security measures that are part of travel now. You walked up to the gate with your family, you kissed everyone goodbye and you boarded the plane. And when you got off, the person you were meeting was standing at the gate. So, you know, the world has changed. 911 had a lot to do with that and the American side of things. And now we have these exhausting and exhaustive security checks, as I mentioned. So um, you need to plan for that. You need to plan your time for that. You can't just rush up. And furthermore, um, I think you have to um, factor in your own physical ability. So you've got time zones to go through. If it takes you 30 hours to get to a location and you find you're in a completely different day, not everyone is gonna function well with all of those changes. Your body is tired, you've been cramped up, you've been uh, breathing recirculated air and perhaps not eating optimal food. So, you know, if you're gonna bam, get up at 4 a.m. in a new time zone and expect to handle the heat and everything else, um, you know, that's asking a lot for many people, maybe not if you're in your 20s or 30s, but as you get older, you know, as I am in your 60s, then it's something else that you want to be prepared for. So, um, so I urge anybody to, you know, plan for that as well. And then 
I think, you know, to speak, uh, keying off something Angela said about missing the essence, I know for myself, I'm going to be in nature. The experience is number one. Absolutely, I want to come back with high level photographs. It's very important to me. If I don't manage it the first time, I'm going to go back for as many times as I need to, as long as my body holds up and I don't run out of money to do it with. But, um, but I think it's extremely important to get quiet, you know, turn it all off, unplug, focus on where you are, try to learn where you are in whatever time you have. And especially remember you're a guest, you know, you're a guest in someone's home. So you're not just a guest in the culture that you are uh, arriving in, but you're a guest in nature. And that's true no matter where you are, even in your own backyard. Uh, it might be your backyard, but for that bird or that animal, it's the whole world. And I think it's very important to slow down and um, honor the, the sentient beings that you came to visit. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that, it's true. And I think a lot of it is the enjoyment that we get out of it is exactly the approach you take to your trip. Your planning and all of that takes the pressure off you when you're there, but then obviously to go in and immerse yourself in it. Now, in my role here at Mashatu, I am a photographic guide. I accompany people out teaching photography. And one of the things we have is a photographic hide. And I cannot tell you how time and time again, my guests tell me that it was the best experience of their safari. And in some cases, they say it was the best experience of their life. And I, one of the reasons is that we get in, we sit down and we just sit and wait for the day. And you never know what's coming. And some days are busy, some days we have just birds come in and yet they still go away, just overwhelmed with the experience. And we arrive early in the morning, we watch, we listen as the sun, as the sun rises, we actually hear the bush coming alive and waking up. And there's calls and sounds that people just miss when they're racing from sighting to sighting. Uh, we have what I always call a lot the just impala, but to watch people sit for 20 minutes patiently waiting and you can almost sense the anticipation that the impala gets to have a drink and gets away and seeing them all of a sudden from with new eyes because these are things they're just racing past all the time. Um, so it's a very special thing to do. And I have to say, I've been doing this for four years now. I probably spend 200 days a year in the hide and I don't get bored. It's different every single day. So anyhow, while we're on that subject, from my previous webinars, a lot of people have said they love to and requested that they see images. So I'm actually going to start this ball rolling with some of my images taken from the hide and just share some moments with you that you can see the type of things you can expect. And if you're a photographer, the type of photographs you can come out with without rushing around by just sitting and waiting patiently. Uh, sick to do a screen share here. Yeah? <laughs> mm, Vicky, or can you confirm you can see my screen there? Yep, yep, looking okay, good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so I'm starting with the smallest of the small, and that's obviously a dove. Um, the first time I realized how beautiful doves are was at the photographic hide. <laughs> and I'm now obsessed with taking photos of doves. Um, and even when there's big things coming in, as is the case here, sometimes I just stay with the dove. <laughs> Let me just. And then sticking with the bird thing, and as the more time you spend in the na with nature, and the more time you spend out just watching, studying, learning, the more you actually get to read what's happening in the bush. So if I'm sitting in the hide or anywhere, actually, <laughs> I used to also be a trails guide. So these birds, red-billed oxpeckers, we, we use them as an indicator species, and they're very useful. I know if the birds come in, they're following animals and they're coming in just ahead of them. So as soon as they get in, I know that I've got, as in this case, an earlunt or impala, a giraffe coming in. So I've got the time to change my lens, be prepared, think about the shot that I want. Obviously, once I know what it is, it helps a little bit more. Um, so we don't discount that. We don't just look and go, oh, it's a bird, because that bird might tell a story. When I wor worked as a trails guide in the Kruger National Park, 
we would walk and it was instantly a Red Bull ox pecker that would alert us to danger or potential danger, making sure that we could get out of the way and not get into a situation with an animal. So. And then another thing that I often, I always try and sort of impress on my clients is when you're shooting, whether in the vehicle or in a hide, don't keep your eye continuously on the viewfinder. You're missing so much. You may be taking a photo of, I don't know, call it the Impala that was standing next to this particular Impala. And then you miss these little moments, the things that come out. So between shots, I always like to stop, put my head up, look around, just take it all in. And then all of a sudden you'll see something that you want to capture and then you can go in and get it. So for me, I just, the moment this female started walking and I realized she's going to line up between his horns, it was the shot that I wanted. I think I probably only took two that day, but I was really happy with the results there. <laughs> and then we need extreme patience. Do not come on safari to Africa, particularly not photographic safari, if you're not prepared to be patient. A species like a giraffe and this old <laughs> war-torn giraffe, really, I just loved his character. Um, giraffe will take up to an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, just to approach the water and feel confident enough to drink. They'll drop down, they'll come up, they'll pace up and down, they'll look around, they'll go down. And we have to bear in mind that we also have a responsibility to the animals. Just because we want the photo, we must know that the giraffe needs a drink. When he gets down and he spreads his legs and puts his head down, he's exceptionally vulnerable to predators and predation. So the rule in my heart is, while that poor giraffe is walking up and down, making sure that it's safe, nobody clicks, nobody talks, nobody moves. You may want the photo of him as he goes down. It's very unfair. Once he gets down and drinks, he's comfortable. He realized he's fine. Then we start off slowly taking a few shots until he's relaxed. And you can still end up with some great shots. Of course, patience pays off. And sometimes you don't have to wait for anything. And you just have things arrive that over deliver and give you so much. And then it becomes a case of you can become very overwhelmed with what's in front of you and not knowing where to shoot and how, what to do. Um, again, these are times that I do say to people, just breathe, put your camera down, take a moment, think about what's there and then decide on what you want. Choose one thing and go with it because you can't have it all. We have times where I've got two, 300 elephants around. And in the beginning, I used to just shoot crazy and come home with nothing I liked. <laughs> and just for sitting back watching, eventually you start to realize what it is you want to capture about the moment. I've added this one just for a little bit of fun because there is a connectedness with nature and with animals um, and not all of them and I'm not anthropomorphizing them, but there are times when certainly with us, we often have this with the elephants in the hide, particularly the bulls, and they'll come and stand close to the window as we're clicking away and they'll suck up a bit of water. I think this happened to you, Vicky, when you were here. And then they'll just take a trunk full of water and spray it straight at you. It's just a fun moment. And then there's more than just animals to nature. There's the way the light falls, there's droplets, there's patterns, there's textures. And if you open yourself up to all these things, there's so much more on offer emotionally as well as photographically. It's just another example of something different you can do, just taking the time out to look and see. This is an elephant slurping up water and it just happened that on that day, the water caught, uh, the sun caught the water behind. And it was a moment, a fleeting moment. I saw it and was lucky enough to capture it. And then we get lucky sometimes. And that's the point. You don't have to go racing from lion to leopard to lion. Patience and persistence, and yes, obviously you're on a shorter time frame on safari, but those sightings will come. They do come if you're in the right place. So, Lion, and I'm going to end with my absolute all-time favorite photo taken from our photographic hide. 
and it was the first time I had a leopard come in. I was having a wonderful morning photographing the confusion of guinea fowl. It was dusty, it was red, and all of a sudden the guinea fowl started going crazy. And this female and her cub came through like a, and the guinea fowl parted like a sea. Um, it was a moment and I, I managed to get the shot. I was very happy with it. And after that, they left and I continued with the guinea fowls. So. Right, and so we'll continue with the webinar. Vicky, um, I'm going to get to you next. Um, you and I have enjoyed a spectacular sunset together, or more than one, on safari without a camera in sight. But we have also spent five days waiting for a leopard cub to reveal itself so that you could get a photo that you had really dreamed of and hoped to get. In fact, you even extended your stay. Instead of doing what many people do and going, oh, it's not going to happen, you realize that for your photography, patience pays off. You also weren't prepared to, and not that we would allow it, but at no point was it a consideration to do anything to upset the mother, to get into the sighting too close. We sat very quietly at a safe distance for five days until the cub showed, showed itself. Um, I want to share some of your images next. I'd like you to talk them through them. But before we do that, can you just tell us, is there anything you're trying to convey when you're shooting in your images? Yes, well, really, I, in all my images, I'm trying to tell a story. Um, I'm trying to bring the viewer to my exact moment of time. And um, particularly, well, for all wildlife, but particularly Africa. Africa's wildlife is so iconic that um, I really want the viewer, the people who may not get to Africa or who may get to Africa and may not see the animals, I really want them to have a sense of how beautiful these animals are in their natural habitat, in their natural state. Good. And your first image is up. Can everyone, Angela, can we see that image? Yes. I see it as well. So yeah, before I first traveled to Africa, I had in my mind, you know, action. You know, I've been watching National <laughs> Geographic and BBC and all these fantastic um, videos. And so, you know, the truth is that many of those videos take months and months to put together. So you may not, you may not see action, but um, when you do, it's very quick. And this particular image, which um, happened in Kenya, was literally seconds, uh, fractions of seconds before this leopard brought down the Koch's hartebeest. And we had been following the, the leopard for over an hour. He had several failed attempts with Impala, and we were parked at a very uh, respectable distance. I had a 600 millimeter lens. And I was actually, I, mean, I knew the leopard was in the thickets. So I was actually focused on a group of male impala. I was just entranced with the way their horns were combining with the grass. And then all of a sudden, bam, all the heads went up and looked. So I looked and this was what the impala were looking at. I got about three frames of this action before the uh, Cox hartebeest went down. And so my, my uh, takeaway on this to, to the viewers, the attendees is number one, be patient. It may not happen. Uh, and number two, when it happens, be prepared. Be prepared at all times. This is not the time for you to be fumbling around on the seat, where's my lens or, or what's my focus or what's my exposure. You need to be ready at all times because these things happen in the blink of an eye. Oh, and I should mention, I'm very proud of that image. It did win uh, Nature's Best category for Wildcat Behavioral in 2019. So that was, I was, I was delighted with that acknowledgement. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so this is action also. You know, we tend to think before going to Africa that it has to be the iconic species. Well, this is an African daughter, daughter with a, a tiger fish. They're both iconic species if you're a birder or, you know, ichthyologist, um, but I think it's also important to remember to include the environment. So the first, the first shot that we showed was very tight, 
because the environment was not all that interesting. It was just grass. But here, I was just fascinated with the patterns in the water. And I think it helps to further tell the story of where the bird lives, where the fish lives, what the interaction is. And you, one can always crop this in post-processing, but if you shoot it tight, that's what you've got. So, um, you know, I would invite anyone as the action's happening, you know, challenge yourself, shoot wide, shoot tight. If you have time, do some verticals. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to be um, creative. Right, so this is the image that, we, that I waited five days for um, and worked hours and hours and kudos to both guides and to you who helped me on my mission. I felt like I was um, on Big Cat Diary and, and that, you know, that's uh, an acknowledgement certainly to Angela and Jonathan Scott, but I did feel it at the time because I was passing all kinds of other action, but I had already had the images I wanted, and it's rare to see a female cup, or, uh, a female leopard with two young cubs. She had just brought them out, uh, maybe days before, and I just had not been lucky enough to be in the right spot at the right time. So I just hunkered down, and um, you know, this is action. It's tender action, but it's it's definitely action. And I was very fortunate. We were staked out on a riverbank betting, and this is kudos to the guide, betting, uh, or the driver guide, betting that the cubs were somehow, somewhere stashed in a Mopani tree around here. So as the female approached, um, we kind of positioned based on the light and where we anticipated she might show up. And he was, the guide was extremely responsive to my instructions. And as, and very, very fortunately, she was eye level. So this was part of what made this image so special. I was not shooting down at the family. They had come up on this branch. So I was literally eye level with the family. It was very exciting. A little bit more action. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to include two species. It can be one, one animal. Um, in this case, this is an older image of mine um, taken in Tanzania. I was standing in um, a safari vehicle I wasn't even, you know, I wasn't even looking in this direction. And all of a sudden I heard this crying, you know, from the bird and my, my head whipped around to see what was going on. And there he was, you know, full throttled, piercing cries. I guess he, he had something to say that day. And I immediately nailed the shot, but I've never seen anything like this. I sincerely doubt I ever will, because once again, I was eye, eye level and he was just, vocalizing with so much energy. So these, these, these events can be um, subtle, uh, but you have to look for them. And for something different. <laughs> yeah. And for something different, that's right. So this is a Namaqua chameleon, um, small animal, uh, not highly endangered, happily, uh, least concern. Um, but, you know, again, this little guy is making a living in an incredibly harsh environment. I mean, it's just broiling hot sand. It's a, it's a miracle to me um, that he could be out there. And um, I was just laying flat on my stomach, uh, shooting as he walked. And I was looking for a clean background. I was looking for um, textures in the sand. And of course he himself is very textured. And so, you know, once, the leg positions showed the, the maximum amount of action. I knew I had the shot I wanted. Nice. Portraits. Um, so portraits are so important. And, um, you know, this, this lion, of course, you know, you can, you can go crazy with portraits and they can become, dare I say, um, too commonplace, but you have to look for something that's different. Well, right away, you know, this lion is blind in one eye and he was presenting the blind eye to me. And then of course, you know, his jaw is open, he's salivating. It was suggested to me that he might've had a jaw injury as well because it didn't look as if his jaw was properly hinged. But to me, you know, it just screams Africa, you know, that, that he's a warrior, he's a survivor, that he's defended his pride numerous times and I converted to black and white um, in post-processing 
is I really wanted to bring out the emphasis of the drama in his fur, especially. And then of course, the contrast between the blind eye and the seeing eye. I feel like he could have um, had an encounter with my, my giraffe photo. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And then here again, a portrait uh, uh, just contrasting tight with wide. Um, this is almost an animal scape, what I would call an animal scape. Um, I generally think of an animal scape with the animal being less than 25% of the photo. So this is kind of getting there. But the point of this was, you know, here's again the environment where this um, oryx lives. You've got the sweep of the horns, you've got this beautiful side portrait, you've got the sweep of the tail, so you almost have like a, a full circle. And for me, the punctuation point, what makes this um, an interesting portrait is the fact that uh, you can see that rear hoof has just struck the sand and kicked it up. So, you know, you're telling a story about um, where this animal lives. And uh, to me, he's just so majestic and possibly my favorite antelope, but I constantly change my mind on that because I think they're all so special. <laughs> um, speaking of going wide, um, I'm not a landscape photographer, um, but there are moments when you have to stop and look around you. And this was an extremely unusual morning on the Okavango River and um, there was fog, uh, just a very unusual event. Uh, tons of fog coming up the water. And um, I'm not sure if it, it, it really communicates fully in this smaller um, uh, presentation of the image, but there's a lot of texture of the fog and the papyrus and of course the sun coming up is, is again, very brief because sunrise and sunset in Africa are quick. The colors were enhanced because of the fog and the reflections on the water. And then, you know, there was a skimmer colony in the nearby area and a bird flew right through all of that. And once again, I knew I had the shot. So quiet moment, but this, this for sure is landscape, maybe an animal scape or bird scape, but, um, it's, it's for me, it's a treasured moment that I may not remember if I didn't have that photo. And every time I look at it, I'm immediately brought right back to that moment in time. Uh, photography is so much about that, capturing moments in time. Yes. And this, wow. <laughs> yeah, so this is an abstract, um, you know, the abstract following the definition of just <clears throat> using what you see in nature. Um, to me, it's just, pure art. I've always, you know, I've, I've loved abstract art. I have a lot of abstract art in my home. I've, my mother made sure I went to the Museum of Modern Art from a very young age, as well as the Metropolitan and the Noya and other favorite places. Um, and I, this was taken from a helicopter doors off. And it just so happened that day that the surf had a myriad of colors and the sand as well. So you know that top bar of sand, which is relatively dry, that has all kinds of animal tracks running through it and streaks from water that had run through it. Then you have that muddy area, um, you know, with those kind of gray scallops and additional lighter beige scallops. And then you see those almost tentacles of where the surf is still reaching. And of course, the, the texture in the water um, as it's Broiling. So, you know, this goes back, I think Angela said it so beautifully, the essence, you know, you could look down and say, oh yeah, well, the, you know, that's water. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, um, for me, it's, it's very powerful. And it, it is in the skeleton coast of Namibia, although you can't see any of the dunes in this picture, but I have a series of images, including the dunes that I don't have in this presentation. So, you know, these, these kinds of abstracts are available no matter where you are, because you're looking for little cameos that are perhaps being ignored because they're in a bigger context. Nice. And your final image. My final image. Well, um, this is truly thinking outside of the box. I want to give, uh, I want to give you some credit here for <laughs> Uh, the last time I was in the hive with you, you said, well, you know, multiple exposures can be fun. And I thought, hmm, oh, that's an idea. Maybe I'll do some of those. And 
um, you know, it's it's kind of like doing blurs or um, you know, or, or pan blurs or motion blurs or zoom blurs. You know, the 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 outcome can be incredibly disappointing because you really don't know what's going on with the camera. But in this instance, this is one of my all time favorite images from Africa because for me it it captures the frenzy at the waterhole. You know, all of these prey animals are at such risk the moment they put their heads down and they know it. So there's this constant jerking up and down, this constant shuffling, even when they're drinking, they're never relaxed, the ears are going. And you know, that lends itself to video, which I'm not that big, I mean, I enjoy it, but I don't enjoy shooting it so much. So, you know, this multiple exposure for me tells us terrific story, you know, you've got one head up and heads down and bodies and, you know, really pulls you in. You have to think about it. I've been told by some people that it makes them dizzy and they don't care for it. And that's fine. I mean, it's a bit out there, but, um, you know, isn't that what art's all about? And at the end of the day, you know, isn't that what photography is about? Uh, a form of art and a, a form of expression and a form to share your own voice. So I just want to thank you for letting me share all those images. Oh, thank you. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> um, you actually brought up two things which we hadn't necessarily discussed um, prior to that we were going to talk about. But uh, Angela, what, something that Vic, Vicky mentioned was about she'd referred to you having the patience on Big Cat Diaries and understanding her sitting at the leopard. And I think that's a misconception people that haven't traveled to Africa may have is that they're watching Big Cat Diaries or National Geographic or Animal Planet and not maybe realizing how much time and effort goes into those sightings. Maybe you can just enlighten us a little bit. <laughs> it is a question that we get a lot. You know, where do you get your patience from? Yeah. But if you have passion, patience doesn't come into it because you love so much what you're doing that you would spend a hundred, a thousand hours just watching and waiting still and being completely present and absorbed in the moment. And I always think it's a, a strange question. And I think you'll find a lot of photographers that are absolutely passionate about, especially nature photography or wildlife, they will, they will sit and absorb whatever it is that they are you know wanting to to express their art through for as many hours as it would take so it patience is a is doesn't really come into it <laughs> excellent so angela you have an incredible body of work that has spanned a few decades um, I'm sure everybody that's watching here has seen your work, knows your work. Um, what is it going forward that you would like people to remember from this body of work? And I'm gonna showcase a couple of your images that you've sent for me and perhaps you can just also chat through with us. Let me just share that screen. <laughs> well, I think, you know, Jonathan and I often talk about the fact that we believe that um, the, the the sense of sight is our most important sense. And of course, the art of photography can really help you express whatever it is that you're, you're trying to share with your audience. And I think um, it will touch people in very different ways, but it will also, it will hum throughout people's bodies in different ways. So they'll either like it, not like it, but they can't be not touched by what they're seeing. And I think this is across the board with photography. It doesn't matter if it's wildlife or journalism. The power of photography is, is extraordinary. And I think, you know, Jonathan and I have been so privileged to travel all over the world, to every continent, to, to see extraordinary things meet wonderful people and at the the end of our career if you like we felt that we were determined somehow to to try and give back a little bit we feel that with our photography i mean it's all very well to have a wonderful body of work but if it's just that it's meaningless really it 
you want it to to say something to have a purpose and so we have started something called the sacred nature initiative we we started it with the first book the sacred nature one which was um, a couple of years ago and then the second one which is just about to come out in fact i've got the first copy just on my desk um, today which is very exciting, but it's sacred nature reconnecting people to our planet because we felt or in our travels have seen this huge disconnect from people with people uh, to nature. And it's a sadness because nature feeds us everything. And without nature, we are nothing anyway. And we are all so connected. I think nature you know, if you're connected to nature, it brings you peace, it brings you joy, it's your your lifeblood, if you like. And I work a lot with children, I have a little grandson, and, and it's amazing working with children, because they get it straight away. And it's sad that as they grow up, and they go into cities, and they lose that connection. Um, so that is our project at the moment our, our mission if you like is to to we have a, this byline that we work with to inspire firstly through photography um to educate because so often it's just through people not understanding or not having been shown or told and when they get it they're like oh, of course and then only then can you conserve because you can't really conserve anything unless you care about it. So inspire, educate and conserve is our, our sort of mission statement, which we work with as a family, our, our son and daughter-in-law um, run our business. So we're very lucky like that. But um, talking about photography and any kind of um, help I can share with um, with some of these images, I would say to people that even if you're coming out on safari and you, you see images, I mean, this is sort of an iconic image because it says Africa, you know, lions say Africa. And it, it, you, you know, you can see it as a double page spread or, um, you know, in a, safari magazine or whatever but i would say to people if you if you get your images go back and share them you know talk to the little village school or share it just with your family so that people can pass it on it's all about your experience if you're lucky enough to come to these extraordinary places like jonathan and i have been um, many people can't they, for whatever reason, they just can't, but they love to be engaged, to share the natural world with each other. And I think if you are a photographer, to share your work, to educate people, to inspire people, to do their little bit, to save the natural world, well, what more can we do? Yeah. So this this image was, was taken a while ago on Big Cat Diary, but... And I love black and white. I started as a child with black and white and in my dark room, which was my passion. So um, I think, you know, shape, texture, you, you know when, you've, when you're, you're, you sort of see an image that is a potential black and white image and certainly elephants always just about uh, lend themselves to doing beautiful black and white because of all the texture and the shape and so this was just a, a, a lovely moment that I had with an old bull who was having a wonderful dust bath in the middle of the day. Beautiful. And this was the same lovely bull and <laughs> again it was as Vicky said you know just um, when you're spending some time and I tend to always drive away from the crowd. I, I don't, I find the distraction and the noise of people. Um, I prefer to get in the zone. I prefer to just be with whatever it is. If it's a little tiny kingfisher, I prefer just to block out the noise and just be with whatever it is I'm taking a photograph of. So that you can almost 
be part of the the image. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you're spending time with a bull elephant, then you know, look at different aspects, look at the trunk, look at the dust, you know, pick up different lenses, take your time, look at it before you pick up the camera in, you know, visualize it in your head of what it could, what, what you're trying to, to make out of that and then pick up your camera and then work with the lenses and the, and the, the camera slowly. I would say to people, go slowly. You don't have to just keep your finger on the button, actually create it in your head, create it in camera. And there's a sense of you really are making that shot. I'm not a great believer in just machine gunning the scene and then going back to the computer and then cropping it and doing all that kind of thing. I prefer to be out in nature taking the shot as I want the shot. So yes, take many shots of different angles, different lenses, horizontal, vertical, and then, you know, hopefully you will find you will get something that you you're satisfied with at the end. Going away from Africa, but tell us about this one. Well, um, actually, Jonathan asked me to put this one in um, because I was once told, I had a wonderful talk with uh, one of the editors at National Geographic, and it always stuck with me. She said, when she's editing photographs for National Geographic, um, she looks at a photograph as if she could, if that photograph tells a story, just the one image, it doesn't need five images to tell her what was going on. And she chose this one actually for, for um, something in National Geographic because she said as she looked at it, she, she just could envisage the whole story about what was going on. The Klebnikov, it had part, you know, we we just parked on this piece of ice and we'd been, uh, this was the circumnavigation of Antarctica. So we'd been on the ship for a while and everybody was dying to get off. And so the captain led us off onto the ice and this one penguin, King Penguin, came popping up to look at us to see what it was. And of course, it was just this classic moment of, of you know, humans meeting wildlife and um, you can almost create the story in we were so thrilled and I, I don't know what he was thinking but he did <laughs> give us a wonderful show and, and do that lovely penguin call so oh. um, yes I put it in to to say to people often you know if you're trying to tell a story try and at least capture one image that tells the story you want to portray to people in one image, it's quite a trick and it's, it doesn't often happen. Yeah, before we go on to the next image, I also just want to mention that something I think people forget is we are also part of the system. You know, humans are not a, a separate from another planet. And I always say that, so, and even that portrays it. it we, let's not forget that we have a place in the system. We have to respect nature and wildlife, but we are part of the system. And I quite like that you've captured people in this, you know, doing what they do in nature, which is a lot of times photography. Let's move on. Now. The thing I love most in um, what I do is trying to be a silent witness. And that's why I think I spend a lot of time just with one, one creature. I don't, I don't necessarily race around. I love to sit and just spend time away from the animal, you know, observing them and just being with them. Sometimes I'm just sitting, reading my book, watching, they might be sleeping. And I know I'm terribly privileged to be able to do that. But um, I love this image because there is, I don't know if you can see it, but Johnny and I can, if you know cheetahs, you know that look she's giving. This was Toto, who was um, one of the stars of Big Cat Diary that I spent a lot of time with. But you can, you can almost feel um, the conversation that was going on between the mother and uh, the, the, the 
baby cheetah. So it's trying to get into their world and, and show, show something, something um, that you really have to, to see, to believe, to witness that is special to the world of a cheetah. So I love trying to do that anyway. And I think this image captures that quite well. And of course, you know, Africa, those early mornings, those brilliant, glorious mornings that we always get up before dark to witness the beginning of the day. And just to say to everybody, if you're a photographer, never think you can sleep in because this is the most magic time of the day. And, you know, just to me, this speaks of those early mornings that we all love so much the mist and the sun coming up and then the birds flying through. And again, I think this image just was one of those ones where, again, it's about witness, stopping, spending time. We'd gone actually to Zambia to photograph leopards. We were writing a book on leopards. And at the time we went, um, there were very few leopards and very quickly we realized that we weren't going to achieve that objective but on our first night there we saw a lot of elephants crossing the river and the our guide he said we we're doing this all the time so i found myself a little bush and i sat under the bush and we went day after day and um you know this was just one of those images i was sitting there watching the elephants um, cross the river and the river it looks as if I've, I've it's actually a slide so nobody can tell me I've ever manipulated this image but it was the way the river was curving made the blue behind the oh. elephant <clears throat> and um, as they were crossing this grey heron flew past me and dropped down in front of the elephants to pick up the fish that were being disturbed under the elephant's feet and all the elephants turned and looked at the heron and it was the shot where the heron's just between the elephants that made it rather painterly, rather peaceful. And I know a lot of men won't um, enjoy a photograph necessarily like this. I've heard this from quite a few people saying, but you know, where's the action? Where's the, where's the drama? And um, to me, nature, most of the time, 99% of the time, nature is quiet and peaceful and just doing its thing. And this, for me, um, represents a lot of the time that I spend in nature, which is, you know, peaceful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And we popped this one in just simply because it's part of our Sacred Nature Initiative um, mission, if you like. One of the things, we travel quite a bit to India, Bhutan, Nepal, and places like that. And we became very interested, obviously, in Buddhism and the, the connection that people there still have between um, their ordinary day-to-day -day lives and nature. And it was always such a, um, a special time for us in the early mornings when we would watch the baby monks go out with their bowls into town and they'd come, you know, they get the rice every morning. They come back to the monastery, but before they eat, they go out and they share it with the birds, the pigeons, the monkeys, whatever is around. And it's just such a lovely connection um, that we feel we've sort of lost in the Western world. And, um, We've always loved our travel there. So we popped that one in just because it touches my heart a little bit. And this is uh, another one of those shots that I, I, I just love to get because it's those sacred moments between mother and child of, you know, this was a, a female lioness that was trying to get her two Young, young cubs 
to the rest of the pride early one morning and they both of them kept running in different directions and she was exhausted trying to pick one up and then the other one would go in the other direction and it, it was on one level wonderfully you know comical and as a woman you could relate to that feeling of you know oh my goodness why don't they just do what they're told and this one ran towards my car and you know as the mother was trying to pick up the other one and she just put her paw right on the back to stop this one to go any further and I just thought it was rather cute. Beautiful, I love this. And again black and white it just brings such drama you know if I could take black and white all the time I probably would. Um, it just speaks to you in a different way, I think. Um, that primal sense of lions when they're, you know, right in the midst of a kill and um, they were actually looking at hyenas that were also trying to come down and get the kill. But it was, it's just a mystery shot, if you like. Uh, I, I would like, like people just to, to, to feel whatever they want to feel in that shot. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Lovely to see the different images and hear the stories behind them. And I feel, and I don't know, and I'm not to, please, if the men are watching, don't take this in the wrong way, but I often feel that women have a different connection when they take photos. And I feel that from looking at both your photos and the way you've spoken about the images. So yeah. that, we Sorry, have these conversations, Janet, myself yeah. and Jonathan, as we work so closely together, um, we it, it is very obvious to us and we we laugh about it. Uh, we chuckle to each other, but we we work so, you know, that's why we we always label all our images, Jonathan and Angela Scott, because mm -hmm. Um, we're such a close partnership that when we're in the field together, wherever it is, wherever we're traveling, I will know, I'll see something and I'll know he will take a better shot of that than I will. And I will run and give him the right lens because I'll know that he should do that. And he does the same for me. Yeah. yeah. And we, you know, I can see that men usually have this wonderful, they have a bigger view perhaps of the world they they see the bigger picture or at least Jonathan definitely he has he loves to tell a story so he loves to have all the components within his shot whereas I love the detail and I love the um, the energy the essence of that which will mean that I'll usually be using the bigger lenses and yeah. it's quite interesting with our books because if we share our books with a couple or you know at a dinner party where there's men and women the men will as we turn the pages the men will say oh i really like that shot it'll be jonathan's <laughs> then we'll again and it'll be the women will say oh that's so lovely and it'll be mine so there yeah. has something in that you know it's not just our imagination no there's a, there's definitely a feminine touch uh, not that one is better than the other but Absolutely. you can just as you can sometimes just see a photo and identify the photographer from their own particular style or definitely. Yeah. Definitely. great um so that brings us to the end of the chat we i do want to do a couple of questions and answers we've had a few that were sent in to us with registration and I have a couple that if people put on live I hope we can get through all but we'll try a couple so let's start with this one I think Vicky I'm going to put this one to you it's from Richard Fisher he would like to hear about the difference between women only traveling versus mixed groups and I'm not sure if you have experience with the woman only group because as far as I know you're just a solo traveler or with mixed groups um <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have not traveled in an all-female group, uh, which is I would be interested in doing. Um, but typically, I do travel by myself. I'll I'll arrive at a location, and I generally meet up with one or two friends, um, and then sometimes other people may join. But in the planning stages, I usually plan with one or two other friends. Um, can be a man, can be a woman. I haven't I haven't noticed a really big difference. Um, as Angela was just talking about, um, 
except to say that in the field, you know, I'm five foot two uh, <laughs> and over 60. I'm not giving the exact number out. I stopped doing that. Um, so if I'm paired up with a man who's 40 and six foot <clears throat> and in his prime, I'm going to be scrambling to keep up. So, you know, I think that it's, um, I, I think that can make a difference if everyone's this, of the same physical condition or same physical size. But on the other hand, um, you know, it's, it's good to push yourself. And um, I don't mind being the last one um, as long as I get there in time. And that's on me. So I'm always working out and I'm always pushing myself um, to be my best version of myself. Um, the, other, the other ways that I travel is periodically I will join a group. Um, I used to do this a lot more earlier on in my photography career. I'd join a group of you know, four or five people. I'd sign up for a workshop. And then you, know, you don't know what's going to happen. And if nobody knows each other, usually the dynamic, you know, it, it kind of sorts itself out. If you arrive and there are couples or friends who already know each other, it can be a little, you know, odd man out type of thing if you're traveling solo. But um, difference between women traveling only versus a mixed group, I, I can't speak to that directly. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Um, it's actually interesting. We ran a poll um, during the webinar. I've been running. I ran a poll for a few minutes, and one of the questions were for the female, the woman watching, would they be interested in women-only photography groups um, or travel groups to Africa? And an overwhelming at the last time, under seventy-one percent were saying yes. So maybe something we should do. <laughs> All right. From and Vicky, I'm going to give this one to you as well because not because of the age, but because of your experience coming to, into this after your accident when you did suffer with um, disabilities. From Hazel Shaughnessy, might a woman of 74 years old who has come some physical limitations be able to travel to Africa? Any help with carrying gear? <laughs> the answer is definitely yes. Do not yes. hold back, um, but plan ahead. So, you know, think about from the moment you leave your house. So, how do you do in airplanes in general? Are you going to be okay in a main cabin? Do you need more leg room? Um, a long trip like that, I always bring therabands and I make sure that somewhere in the course of the flight, I stand in the galley and I do stretches, make sure I get the kinks out. Give yourself time when you get there. I mean, you should have a greeter in an airport, hopefully to help you. Of course, he can't load your bags up at the, at the gate, but I mean, at the um, carousel, but you, you want to get as much help as possible. Make sure you tell your workshop leader what your limits are um, so that he or she can prepare and, um, and help you. But there's, I mean, I, I, I always let the workshop leader know if I find myself really physically challenged, which um, for example, in South Georgia, I was, I mean, the heavy snows and high winds, um, you know, I, I just had to accept the fact that I wasn't going to keep up with everybody because I wasn't. And, um, you know, there are things all around to see, you know, so you have to kind of recalibrate your head. If you're in a safari vehicle, it doesn't matter that you have um, perhaps a slower gait than someone else. because You're all in it together. So just make sure you communicate, communicate constructively, communicate ahead of time and ask for help. And I've never had someone not help me if I've asked from a variety of, and even from complete strangers, if I couldn't get something into the overhead, for, for example, someone would give me a hand. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna put this one to you, Angela. As a wildlife artist, making research trips can be prohibitively costly using conventional safari camps and itineraries. Don't always provide the experiences needed by a creative professional. That is prolonged undisturbed periods in one spot to capture reference material like Angie mentioned. With that in mind, which parks would the panelists consider the most accessible for self-drive options? Or do they have advice about directly hiring local guides? or perhaps parks or camps that seek creative professionals in residence? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a tricky question. That's mm. a very tricky question. I mean, I think, I think I probably, I mean, this, I'm thinking off the hoof now. 
I would Sorry. advise people to when they're doing their research in you know whatever African country they 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 desire to go to they would be better off to find a good guide first and foremost I mean you would like to say I mean we all drive in all these parks um, but we do have the experience of living here and understanding um, the do's and don'ts and the the culture and all the myriad of things that is good to know and it's not necessarily about the dangers but it's just about protocols and it's about uh, how well do you know wildlife are you gonna just drive up to a leopard and cub and you know it'll run away if if you are familiar with wildlife and how to behave around wildlife um well perhaps you know self-drive is a good thing but you'd probably get more out of it by um, researching. And yes, all of us, I mean, C4 is, is extraordinary with their, their professional guys and the experience they have in helping people um, find the safari of their dreams. Um, you know, you could have a self-drive, but have a guide with you. Um, I don't know if I'm answering this question. I think you are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint a particular reserve or game park because, I mean, it could be Kenya, South Africa, Botswana, Angola. And I guess if it's a self-drive, it's do your research um, beforehand on the country you're going to. I mean, and realize, I, I, I'm assuming it's the same in Kenya, but say for instance, at the Kruger National Park in South Africa. It's a wonderful reserve to self-drive, but there are limitations creatively. You're, you're stuck to being on the road and there are times when you're stuck in a sighting with 10 other vehicles. Um, so- I think the same with Kenya. I mean, with your, all the, the parks here, uh, I'm sort of thinking as I'm but thinking about people even coming in from Nairobi into, into the parks and not really knowing where the prides are, where the animals are, are you allowed off road driving, are you not? Um, people breaking rules, be not because they are wanting to um, particularly um, break the rules, but because they don't know the rules and the rules are not easily accessible. And then um, that's not great either for the park or for people. And, you know, these parks are huge. So if you're driving and you have no idea where you're going, that doesn't really benefit you terribly. Um, mm -hmm. It's much better to have somebody who, a local that knows the area that can help you achieve your objective in that area and also not harm the area. I think that's as well as as comprehensive as we can cover that one. Um, but I'm going to follow on with directly with another question, which I noticed would ties in a bit to what you just spoke about, putting you on the spot, Angela. <laughs> um, from Rita, what, if anything, is being done to limit the negative impact with so many vehicles and people, um, the negative impact to the environment and animals on safaris being made by so many vehicles and people? Um, I think it's a constant, it's a constant, there, there are many, there are many organizations, people who really do try driver's training, you know, people in the camps, you know, really helping the guides, trying to help the guides know how to, actually, you know, if I'm really honest, which I hope I can be without being offensive, but it's often the photographers themselves that are the problem because the photographers will try and push the guide to get them closer, to get them off road, to, to push the animal for the shot. And I think sometimes the guides are, you know, they want to please the client and the photographer. And so they will perhaps do things uh, that they know is not in the animal's best interest, perhaps a little bit too pushing. And I think there is a lot of education being done to help the guides to 
um, manipulate that difficult issue so that the client is happy and doesn't get really angry and upset with them. Yeah. Um, so it's not always the park's fault. You know, um, I think a lot of organizations are trying to bring more money into the parks to help with structure and roads and, and things like that, which is, you know, and it's a, it's a constant um, moving, moving all the pieces of the puzzle of, you know, everybody being satisfied with what they're wanting out of a, a game drive, if you like. And I, I definitely understand. I see that. I do see that quite a bit with photographers here. Not all of them by any means, but there are some that do want to push boundaries, um, either driving too fast or get off road and asking guides to get out of a, a comfort zone um, yeah. where they're not supposed to. But um, it's intriguing, interesting because it also doesn't take that much. We, we've, we're undergoing a process here and we've worked out that simple little things where there's a junction in a road by not shortcutting and just actually taking the, the corner properly. If every guy just does that, that already has a huge impact on the environment. And then thinking about what we off-road for. So we, we our policies changed a little here. We, we had quite a lot of freedom, but now, no, it's got to be a special sighting. We don't just go off-roading for... And when it's a special sighting, I don't mean a cat, it means something that unique happening, but not for a sleeping cat or, so it's little things that can make quite a big difference um, to that. Absolutely. Vicky, uh, the next, there's two questions. I'm gonna put them in one for you. It's um, because you travel and you will know which is this. So one is, the first one's just what lenses do you do most? But I'd like to tie it into the one if you could only take one lens to Africa, which would you take? Mm, and sorry, and have you tried mirrorless? <laughs> yeah, so I have converted over to mirrorless. Um, I'm a Canon shooter, and when the R5 came out, I I completely moved over to the mirrorless. I sold all my 1DX bodies, and I love the fact that it's silent. I love the histogram. There are some other wonderful features. Um, that I you know go beyond the scope of this conversation, but um, I, the fact that it's silent is marvelous. It does make a big difference um, in terms of uh, respecting the animals and even respecting co-shooters. I once had a terrible situation happen in um, the Arctic where I was on a ship shooting and apparently my camera distressed someone who was standing right next to me. Um, and with the 1DX body, if you slip to uh, silent, you all of a sudden lose, you know, 14 frames a second, you're down to seven, you know. So, so with the electronic shutter on the R5, I'm, I'm super happy. And uh, it is lighter, which makes hand-holding uh, the R5 with a 600 combination manageable for me. Whereas the Canon 1DX2 or 1DX3, with the 603 were, that was, that was harder. It was more of a struggle. I couldn't hold it for quite as long. Um, as far as the lenses that I use, um, you know, I, I don't mind packing heavy because I, you know, my lens does me no good if it's sitting back at home and the perfect opportunity arises. However, my go-to lenses for sure, the 600 millimeter F4, I have the number three version, which is the lighter. Um, the, new R5, um, the new RF 100-500 and uh, the new RF 24-105. I mean, those are, I take those with me everywhere. If I can get away with it from a packing perspective, I'll throw in a 1635. If I'm going to be doing any night photography, I'll put in a 14 millimeter. Um, that's, those are kind of my go-tos. Depending on where I am, I have an 1124, which is really good for Antarctica or um, anywhere where you need a more global picture, you know, so get the underside and the overside of, of um, ice flow, which a uh, shout out to a special friend who um, turned me on to that lens. And I don't know if she's listening or not. Um, but um, so, so I would say try to keep it simple for Africa because you want to be fast. 
You do not want to be changing bodies in the field. Um, number one, you may not have time. And number two, it's dusty and you're going to get your sensors filthy. So if you can swing it, have a, have a camera body on three lenses, um, you know, a, a super telephoto, an intermediate telephoto and um, a wide angle for landscapes. And, you know, those animals, if they're comfortable, they will walk towards you. So you might start out with a 600 and then you're over lensed and then you grab a one five and believe it or not, you can still get over lensed. And um, you just wanna be nimble and prepared. You wanna have everything ready with your exposure, everything ready with your focus, everything ready with your drive. I mean, don't leave anything to chance because you may not get another chance. So um, I think I answered that. Um, but I also, I saw in the chat, if you don't mind, I'm gonna handle this. Um, mm -hmm. There was a question about traveling with a tripod. I always take a tripod. Um, I, pa I pack it. I pack it, it goes into check-in luggage. Anything that's metal goes into check-in. Check Anything that's glass comes with me, um, which makes it heavy. Um, so, you know, I get onto that plane and I'm loaded down. Um, sometimes I'll have a rolling bag, sometimes a backpack, but each one of my bags have an insert in them. I can pull out the insert, slide it under the seat. If someone needs to valet that bag because it's too big, which can happen even here in the States on regional flights or certainly within Africa, then, you know, you can have the bag. It's empty. I've got all the glass. And you know, wrap up your tripod carefully, put it in its case, throw a bunch of bubble wrap around it. Same thing with the ball heads, you know, anything that is non-breakable, uh, just pack it in, you know, make sure you layer it in between clothing so it's really buffered. Nice. Yeah, it, it's actually a very important consideration that, Vicky, I also have just changed to the Canon R6. Um, but one of the big reasons was I wasn't coping with the heavy equipment and I actually started to hate what I was doing because I was just like, oh, lugging everything around. And and I just realized I need to enjoy it. So I've, uh, you know, and I say that to people even if it means you're not getting, a, in this case, I'm lucky I've got a really great camera, but I would have downsized my lens. Previously, I did. I went to a less professional lens, but to have one that I could manage and that I was comfortable with. Um, and it may be different for everybody, but if you're not managing with the heavy equipment, you're going to miss the shot and not enjoy yourself. Uh, so I'd like to just uh, add one thing to that, Janet. You know, <clears throat> having been a cyclist and an athlete, you know, uh, this might sound a little harsh, um, but I always kind of I always kind of went with the idea that I had to suck it up. Right? Uh -huh. You know that if you know if you're going to run with the big dogs, get off the porch. If you want to be out there with the big equipment, you have to train for it. So yeah. I would urge everybody, you know, that that big gear, those big lenses can make a big difference. I lift weights every day faithfully and I'm not this big hulking thing I'm a small person but I lift I, I train my body to handle the weight of my gear yeah. you've got to be able to handle your own equipment you know just like when I was a cyclist if I had a flat I had to be able to fix my flat and I'm sure there are athletes out there who understands you know some other metaphor um, that I'm talking about so you want to be independent you want to be capable um, I just came from a workshop where, you know, I was invited to portage my own canoe. It was an invitation. There was another woman there, my size, um, a super athlete, exceptional outdoors woman, and she wanted to do it. And she, you know, by the second day she was marching all along, I was like, yeah, okay, well, I'm almost 20 years older than you. I have some issues. I'm not going to portage my own canoe. Thanks yeah. very much, but I'm going to handle my own gear. And you need to be creative about how you figure it out. So yeah. if you can't handle it, before you leave, don't take it, but work on handling it. So exactly. you, know, you have that opportunity, be in shape, get on some kind of a cardio routine where you can keep going, you know, and that you're not dragging behind because that isn't safe in many locations if you're, you know, if you're on foot, you don't wanna be in bear country and be isolated. Um, so, so you now I just get off on that because, you know, I think it's important. You now I think it's really important to um, challenge yourself, not just create creatively, but also physically. This is a physical activity. 
if you're doing wildlife, you know, there are gonna be bugs, there's gonna be mud, there's gonna be cold, it's gonna be hot, it's gonna, you know, you're not gonna be comfortable. And I'm sure there are a lot of wildlife photographers, you know, watching this who already know this, but particularly when it comes to the gear, if you can lighten the load, uh, for me that R5-600-3 combination was just, you know, that extra whatever half pound difference, mm -hmm. it's still heavy. I still have to work out yep. to make sure I can handle it. Nice, thank you. Um, there's a lot of questions. I don't think we're gonna, we're not gonna get to all of them. We've been at this an hour and a half already. It's getting dark. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to close off this webinar now. Um, I just want to leave with a quote that I found while I was preparing for the webinar, um, which really resonated with me. Uh, it's a quote by Karen Blixen, the author of Out of Africa, a book and a movie that inspired many a woman to travel this continent. Um, there is something about safari life that makes you forget all your sorrows and feel as if you had drunk a half a bottle of champagne, bubbling over with heartfelt gratitude for being alive. I think whether it's, um, and this is my quote over, whether it's because you come for photography or you come to experience it, the, Africa is a beautiful place. And I really, if you haven't been, implore you to come. I, I feel that everybody should visit once and just come and be touched by Africa. Vicky, Angela, thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. I love thank you to see you again, Vicky. Yes, like and Angela. We'll see each other again. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Right. Bye now. Bye.